Shanta, would you like to start the meeting? Start the lecture and the morning proceedings, please. Shanta? Yeah, I am here. Should we start? Will you, will you start? Yeah, uh, should I start, Aruna? Yes, yeah. please start. Yeah. <laughs> please begin. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, each one of you today for this uh, very important uh, uh, conference uh, in memory of uh, uh, SR Shankaran. It's an SR Shankaran Memorial Lecture. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, Chief Justice Murli that will be speaking today. Uh, and uh, I have seen, I'm looking at the number of participants in this meeting. And uh, I'm glad that it is a virtual meeting. Sometimes one is not very happy that it is a virtual meeting. You would like to meet them in person. But then you would not be having such a huge audience of very, very important people, each one of you actually, who fought for human rights and who are still fighting uh, against the kind of uh, political disposition that we have today. Uh, before I begin, I would like to, in fact, uh, invite Aruna Roy and Bezwada Wilson to uh, lay the context for the meeting. And I will not take much uh, time, but uh, please, Aruna and Bezwa Wilson. Thank you, Shanta. Uh, this is the second Shankaran Memorial Lecture. Actually, there's been a gap of four years between the first and the second lecture. Uh, not least responsible was COVID. Uh, Wilson and I tried to organize uh, a meeting online, but it didn't work out. The person we wanted was not available. And it, so it went on and on. So this year, uh, Wilson and I and Harsh, all three of us got together to see whether we could really hold this conference in person as a physical meeting in Delhi. But even that didn't work out, but we finally decided that it should be held anyway, which way. Uh, the decision to hold these memorial lectures is part of the School for Democracy's commitment to the values that Mr. Shankaran held most dear, and which are the values and principles the School for Democracy also proposes to take forward. So we are committed to hold this memorial lecture with the Safai Karamchari Andolan and with this, the Center for Equity Studies this year. But the first one was, uh, we were in collaboration with others. But Safai Karamchari Andolan and School for Democracy, and now I hope the Center for Equity Studies will be part of the organizing team in the future. And we should continue with it. You all knew Mr. Shankaran, for me, he has been an absolute touchstone and a person who really uh, interpreted public morality at its best. He was a person whom I went to at all times to test my ideas, to sound the ethics of my, uh, of my decisions, and he was always fantastic. So I won't go on too long, but I just want to say that next year there'll be another memorial lecture, which is a promise that we make and I would, and the last lecture was delivered by Wilson in which Justice Muridi there was the chair. So, <laughs> so I'm quite happy that we are all here as a big family again. And as Shanta pointed out, it's human rights, it's rights, it's justice, it's equality, it's constitutional values. Over to Wilson. Good evening and it is an honor to talk about the memorial lecture of the yes, sir, Shankaran sir. And this the time which we are all facing in our country and the particularly democracy. It is in a need of the Shankaran sir is a very much important. And we had a only one Shankaran sir, but later we are seeing there could be another one more, two, three, four. So we are so fortunate that we have met Shankaran sir. That is the reason I am also today in front of all of you. And Safai Karmachari Andolan also has come to the, this kind of in a level that is just because of the legacy of the SR Shankaran sir. And today we want to say very clearly that 
the democratic values to take it forward. We are fortunate, we have seen it. But through these lectures, the next generation also must see and know about him much. That will definitely give an accountability of the government making the name, as he said, and he stood in front of the government for the sake of the marginalized, most oppressed people. And particularly, the whoever is not in the power, for them, he was in a, like a sitting there and said that, I am a government, so I can do for this. Like even for the smallest person in Hyderabad, the person who is a cobbler, to have the small shop, it was so difficult. Because of Shankaran sir, he went all the way. So that is in a set as an example. Today, there is in a, so much we talk about the propaganda. And we talk about the small thing also, everybody. But whatever he did, he never told to anyone. So that is then a legacy, that is then a memorial lecture. Those experiences will be going to share. And that is the reason we want to continue this. And I am so happy that Harsh, Arunaka and me and the Murali and we are all there again coming together and making this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wilson. And thank you, Aruna. Uh, I know there is so much to share about uh, Shankaran Garu and all of us knew him personally. Each one of us claimed that he was our best mentor. So, you know, that that is, I think, the gift Shankaran had. Uh, I would now request Harsh Mandar to introduce Shank Shankaran Garu to us. And we know Harsh Mandar, of course, from the Center for Equity Studies. And who better than him to introduce Shankaran to us? Harsh. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Ash. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it, it's a it's 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 a profound honor to be here, uh, remembering Mr. Shankaran. How much we miss him more and more with every year that passes since he left us. Uh, he missed seeing India in its in the Indian Republic in its most difficult period uh, when. Uh, constitutional democracy is being dismantled in multiple ways. Uh, we needed him uh, more than ever because he was a moral lodestar for so many of us in government, outside government, in struggles. And uh, as Wilson reminded us, uh, those who survive in the outermost margins of our society. Uh, I know I have very little time and we've all gathered really to listen to Justice Murlidhar um, so just, I was, you know, thinking you know, for the last many days, uh, you know, what should I sort out from so many wonderful memories of this, of this person who left, left us, especially for generations, younger generations who didn't know him personally. Um, so I thought I'd take two very quick examples from within his work uh, as a civil servant and two outside. Uh, the first was, um, uh, I think he'll always be remembered for the battle that he took against bonded labor. Uh, this was a time when it was not uncommon for people to, to get into debt and for their entire lifetimes be bonded and then uh, for successive generations. And he, uh, he not only uh, uh, drafted the law uh, that made bonded labor uh, illegal, but also went from village to village um, uh, uh, for 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 preparing people to to uh, to seek their freedom. The second uh, was his the period uh, when he was chief secretary in Tripura. Those seven years was an extraordinary period because there were two men, he and Nipun Chakravarti, as the chief secretary, uh, two uh, uh, bachelors. Uh, extremely honest, deeply committed to the poorest, and they demonstrated together what, uh, you know, what government uh, can be. Um, in, his in his sort of life uh, as, a, as a public citizen, uh, again, I think one of the things, of course, we'll most remember him was his uh, leadership of the uh, Safai Karantari Andolan uh, and the mentorship he provided to uh, my beloved brother, uh, Biswada Wilson in battling, uh, I think, in some ways, perhaps uh, the most uh, 
uh, the most shameful, uh, uh, you know, remnant of uh, untouchability in the caste system. And lastly, I wanted to recall his role uh, in the Citizens Committee. This was a Citizens Committee for actually what for deepening democracy, as they called it, which was against, uh, you know, there was no one else uh, except him who both the government and, uh, you know, uh, people in the radical left uh, were willing to accept his moral authority. And he negotiated about how violence could come down from the state, but also uh, from this, you know, when you fight for for justice without violence. Um, you would, uh, you know, so as a public servant in a constitutional democracy, I think we will always, you know, if I have to imagine the ideal public servant, I think of uh, Mr. Shanklin, his unshakable commitment to the constitutional morality and human rights, his unimpeachable integrity, financial and moral, and his deep commitment to a life of equal dignity for the most oppressed of our people. So as a citizen, he and as a citizen, he was both an inheritor of Gandhi, who reminded us of, of that last person, and Ambedkar, who reminded us about the values of our constitution. He embodied all of these. And then, uh, even further as a human being, he was close to being saintly. Uh, I had the privilege of staying with him many, many, many days whenever I would go to Hyderabad and watch him closely, his personal life. But he was kind uh, and uh, he had an impish sense of humor. Uh, so even when he is not with us, uh, I, I, I know I'm not alone in still looking to him to guide us as our country and our world passes through this time of immense darkness. Uh, his ethics uh, and his politics are, you know, shed the kind of light we need to guide us uh, in our way forward for public morality. Uh, so um, long live um, Zindabad, uh, S.R. Shankaran, and for, for all that you have given uh, uh, to all of us uh, and to the world. Thank you, Hush. Uh, I, I think uh, this is a, a truly a moving uh, uh, and inspiring uh, introduction to Chakran. We have so much to share, so much to say. And in fact, I want to say a little thing that, uh, I mean, uh, just as you, I owe almost everything to Chakran that I'm speaking to you has got to do with uh, the mentorship of Shankaran Garu. And here, one institution that he set up, which helped us a lot, is the institution of social welfare hostels. It has now become residential schools. And when we got children back into the education system, without the social welfare hostels, I don't think one could have even given the little bit of dignity that children uh, would have. And he helped us a lot in setting up that institution. I will not take any more time, but uh, I would like to invite uh, Reddy Subramaniam. He is now the CEO of uh, Center for Research and Schemes and Policies, but much more about what he did as a Secretary uh, Rural Development. And in uh, Hyderabad, uh, in Andhra Pradesh also, uh, I worked a lot with him when he was a Commissioner for School Education. Uh, uh, Reddy Subramaniam, if you are there, please. Thanks, ma'am. And... Uh... <clears throat> I'm asked to pay tribute uh, to a person who stood tallest. He's diminutive to look at, but stood really tallest among all his peers and all the people around him, just by the commitment to the cause of the poorest and the marginalized. How do I make, how do I pay tribute to a person who lived the life of the poorest? and thought and spent every minute that he has got for designing schemes, policies, acts, bills for their welfare. Whether it is, uh, whether it is Bonded Labor Abolition Act, whether it is minimum wages, whether it is uh, untouchability, uh, fight against the untouchability, fight against the manual scavenging. Here is a person who has actually taken the fight to the logical conclusion. How do I pay tribute to a person who has stood so tall that his, his influence, his shadow has, has actually led many young officers in the path 
of um, of working for the poorest how do i really pay tribute to a person who used his authority authority so many people have got but how the person who has used the authority always for the welfare of the poorest how do i really uh, you know pay tribute to a person who is so result oriented that sometimes even the most professional have, uh, also are put to shame how does anyone pay tribute to a person who has spent all his time with the people whether uh, walking around the villages sitting with them understanding their understanding their problems and immediately trying to come out with a solution to address that how do i how do i pay tribute to a person who mentored so many youngsters in the path of righteousness and in the path of working for the poor no one can really pay tribute to a person who has actually made working for the poor a fashionable thing among the is so normally officers keep on fighting for you know more lucrative jobs and that that is you know, more and more that is becoming uh, a thing of reality but here is a person who actually made working for the poor the most fashionable thing among the young officers so the brightest of the people have worked for the for the poorest and for the tribals how do i really pay tribute to a person who really believed in peace in human rights to the depth of uh, his heart and then he is prepared to fight the government With, within the government he is pre- he is prepared to fight with the government to see that a, a right course of action is taken when violence is avoided and peace is restored and rights are protected so we have we have such a uh, such a phenomenal person who has actually preceded us and i really feel privileged blessed that i could i could uh, spend a lot of time with him and learned so many of my uh, of my alphabets in administration from him and then like me so many of my colleagues have actually been influenced by him so he is actually set a new trend in the administration uh, what we call as the welfare administration friends i really feel that words uh, there are no words to pay tribute to such a person today we see in many of the andhra villages statues of shankaran set up and then people are worshiping they are on, on this on his birthday people uh, you know gather around that uh, the statue and then worship the sing songs and then all um, all in remembrance of the fight that he has carried out for the poorest and the weakest but i'm sure shankaran is not a person who would really love that sort of a person worship i know him very well uh, and the sort of unassuming nature that he has got i'm sure what he just expects us everybody is to just tread the path of righteousness be su- support the poor and the marginalized the untouchables and then because that is where the requirement of an officer is there so i think that is the that is a sort of message that he would like to give to everybody and i'm sure that is the best way we can pay tribute no words can really match our actions so i really hope that uh, this sort of occasions will really inspire the younger generations to start working for the causes that he stood for thank you very much thanks a lot subrahmanya for this and uh, i know that uh, we are all waiting for uh, chief justice murli that to uh, uh, deliver his lecture but i do have uh, to mention a couple of lines about murli that could have been asked by the organizers to introduce him and i don't know why we need his introduction because all of us know him as a judge uh, who stood by the weakest uh, and the poorest and showed how the voices of the poor can become the voice of establishment and uh, he put into practice the gandhian talisman uh, of taking up uh, the cause of the weakest person and look, and he looked to the victims of so many cases i am for short of time i will not mention all that it is all there you just click a google search and let me tell you you will get volumes of uh, material uh, on murli uh, taran please do that uh, i will just quote something that he said which stuck with me uh, which he said over the years i have realized that it is not enough for lawyers and judges to speak about constitutional values it is essential to imbibe them the constitutional values of equality non discrimination dignity 
prohibition of untouchability, inclusivity, and plurality have to be practiced continuously at both a personal and professional level. Uh, uh, there is so much in common, I must say, between Shankaran and Murli that when I was actually reading about him, don't be embarrassed, uh, Chief Justice Murli, that about it. Uh, I, I mean it from my heart. Now, we know that the current disposition did not take any of such values uh, 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 well and uh, how he was unceremoniously transferred to Delhi in a way that showed his mettle much more on what he did in Punjab and Haryana as a Chief Justice and in Orissa, when he in fact showed that the digitization can need not be a terrorist activity, but pro-people activity. We, we know how digitization has harassed people through the Aadhaar card and through so many uh, other means. But if you look at, again, what he did on uh, uh, transition of uh, Orissa's courts and offices to a paperless mode where uh, he had provided the instrument both for the litigant as well as uh, the courts. Uh, and it's a mine of information. He, wherever he was posted, he, were, he endured himself. Uh, and we know about the kind of farewell parties that came for uh, Murli that uh, we all know about it. I would say that in today's, again, undemocratic politics of exclusion, divisiveness, unfreedom, and the tyranny of power, which has ev uh, invaded every institution of the country, including the judiciary, it is Justice Murli this moral imperative to uphold constitutional values, which is keeping the faith of ordinary citizens in our institutions of democracy and giving us hope. I would like, I, I have prepared a longer speech, but then I know we are all waiting to listen to uh, Justice uh, uh, Murli uh, uh, to deliver the second SR Shankar Memorial Lecture on apparent and transparent what entails justice seem to be done. Thank you very much, Murlidhar, for being with us, and we look forward to hearing you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Shantaji. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be asked to deliver this uh, lecture in honor of a very tall person in every sense of the word. I mean, of course, not his actual physical stature, but in terms of what a human being Shankaran Garu was. Uh, I've had the fortune of uh, knowing him personally, but not as long as I wish I had. I can share all the sentiments expressed by Wilson, Arunaka, Tarsh, Redigaru, and anyone and everyone who's come into contact with Shankar. Uh, he was an exceptional human being, bore his uh, uh, tallness so lightly. And within five minutes of conversing with him, you knew the depth of his knowledge, the depth of his experience. And above all, his compassion. And uh, he, it taught me a lot. And uh, his life, his work did form an inspiration uh, during my years, both as a lawyer and as a judge, and will continue to inspire. When uh, Arunaka asked me to uh, speak, the, the question was, what should I speak on? And uh, we went back and forth till I suggested that would this kind of a topic work? And she said, I think it will. Uh, I know this is a topic which interests everyone, uh, particularly because the workings, the inner workings of the judiciary is still mystical to many a person. Not only do they find the laws and legal procedures uh, mystifying, but even the way the courts function, the language that the courts speak, and the judgments written seems to distance the people from the courts by the very nature of that institution. I must say, however, the Indian Supreme Court, particularly in the PIL jurisdiction, has tried to break these walls and uh, 
project itself as a court reaching out to the people. But uh, the history of this institution and the way it's been structured continues to create the distance between the people and the courts. If there's one thing that we look for in decision makers, whether they may be judges in courts or even bureaucrats who take very important decisions on files, the minimal expectation is fairness. Fairness in every sense of the term. We want a degree of impartiality, objectivity, and for the decision maker not to be influenced by extraneous factors. So this kind of unifies, in one sense, the bureaucracy and the judiciary and any other institution which has decision makers. So I thought it would be an apt topic in memory of uh, Shankaran Garu, because I think he imbibed in himself all these essential values that we, we want so much to see in judges. So this topic, apparent and transparent, what entails justice seem to be done. People familiar with the law would have very often heard this phrase, justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done. And for those who are not aware of its origins, it was spelt out in a judgment which was delivered almost exactly 100 years ago on November 9th of 1923 by Lord Justice Huart, H-E-W-A-R-T, that's how the name is spelled, who was then Lord Chief Justice of England in a case that goes by the name of Rex versus Sussex Justices. The case itself is not a very complicated one. One Mr. McCarthy, while driving his motorcycle, collided against another motorcycle, which was driven by one Mr. Whitworth with his wife in the sidecar of that motorcycle. As a result of the coalition vote, which is against Mr. McCarthy, and also a civil case for damages. The civil case came up before the justices of S Sussex. Mr. Whitworth had engaged the services of a law firm for law solicitors. The firm went by the name of Messrs. Langham, Sun, and Douglas. It so happened that Mr. Langham, who was part of the firm of solicitors, also happened to be the deputy clerk in the court of the justices. So when it's the justices retired to the chambers to decide the outcome of the case, this deputy clerk, who was not present that day, but his younger brother, who was then officiating, and the younger brother was also associated with this firm, he also was seen accompanying the judges into the chamber. When the verdict went against McCarthy, he appealed, and one of the grounds of appeal was that a person was associated with a firm engaged by Mr. Whitworth had been seen retiring into the chambers of the judges. And there's every possibility that he influenced the outcome of the case which went against Mr. McCarthy. Quite extraordinarily, the King's Bench called for an affidavit from the Sussex justices. They filed an affidavit. They said, yes, the deputy clerk did come into the chambers of the judges. He was definitely present physically, but, and I'm just quoting, he scrupulously abstained from any discussion on this case. And they asserted that they arrived at the decision unbiased by the fact that the deputy clerk was a member of the law firm, which had been engaged by Mr. Whitworth. So the King's bench went into a long discussion. It was a bench of three judges, Lord Hoover presiding, and he wrote the judgment. He agreed and he believed the Sussex justices that they arrived at their conclusion without being influenced by the presence of the deputy clerk who happened to be associated with the firm engaged by the claimant. And they said, we do not uh, for a minute doubt that they arrived at their judgment objectively. But they then spelled out a very important principle. And this is the exact quote. 
it is not merely of some importance, but is of fundamental importance that justice should not only be done, but should be manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to, done, seen to be done. So this is what Lord Hubert actually said. He said what was important was not what was actually done, but what might appear to have been done. And he went on to say nothing is to be done, which creates even a suspicion that there has been an improper interference with the course of justice. So this reasonable apprehension in the mind of a litigant that the judgment could have been swayed against the litigant by this kind of a conduct of the justices was enough for the king's bench in this case to nullify the conviction against Whitworth, against Mikhar. So the fine itself was just a 10 pound fine as a result of that conviction. But the judges still went ahead and set aside that conviction against McCarthy. So this principle, this essential principle of justice being seen to be done has you know, prevailed and it forms the basis of many of the norms that have been evolved for the functioning of judges. In India, we haven't succeeded in actually making this part of any statute. While the constitution talks of impeachment of judges for improper conduct, for misconduct, for proven misconduct, and which is a very high threshold, uh, although there have been attempts at impeachment of judges of the high court uh, and one judge, the Supreme Court, uh, these attempts have not succeeded because of this very high threshold. And even if this high threshold was met, because it requires the parliament to vote on the motion for impeachment, the only motion that was stable failed because of the abstention of the largest ruling party at that point in time. And two other attempts, when the motion was discussed in parliament, the judge in question resigned, and therefore the motion lapsed. The law commission has, of course, brought out reports, and there was an attempt in parliament to table what is called the Judicial Accountability and Standards Bill, where they wanted to make part of the statute what is called the Restatement of Values of Judicial Life, which was adopted by the full court of the Supreme Court of India on 7th May 1997. Just in this month of November, we've had the United States Supreme Court bring out a proper statement of what it considered uh, values of judicial life, and I'll refer to it very shortly. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is something that has troubled people, that judges with enormous power of deciding the uh, fate of uh, people, of uh, governments, of entities, of corporations, uh, must be held accountable to certain standards. One obvious standard is about the rule of bias. Again, for uh, I'm explaining this to any member of the audience who may not be aware of the twin principles of natural justice, and we've now added a third principle to it, which I will explain. One is nobody should be a judge in his own cause. The second is nobody should be, uh, uh, no decision to, should be taken against a person without giving that person an opportunity. The third thing which has evolved is that whatever decision that is taken must be, uh, must contain reasons, must be a reasoned decision. This is almost considered to be a third uh, tenet of the rules of natural justice. On the first principle that uh, the decision maker should not be biased, there can be various forms of bias. The most obvious being the rule of pecuniary bias. Uh, people uh, generally talk of uh, you know, judges being influenced, and this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, this is uh, accompanied judging and judges from time in uh, If you remember the case of uh, Raja Nandakumar, who was brought to trial before the Supreme Court of Calcutta, I think the year of 1774, 
uh, Eleja Impe was the chief justice. And one of the charges in the impeachment of the then Governor General Warren Hastings was that he was so closely associated with Eleja Impe that he procured this conviction by unfair means. And uh, of course, it's a different story that after seven years of uh, facing those proceedings in the British Parliament, uh, they could not uh, convict Hastings for impeachment. But those were the early instances where judges had to face accusations of bias. Bias can be in various forms, as was mentioning. Uh, there could be a bias as a result of uh, you know, past associations. Many lawyers become judges, and in their life as lawyers, they've had many instances where they may have formed opinions, defended persons, represented against persons. So past associations can be expected to influence the present decisions. So what uh, the courts have evolved are norms of disclosure. It is expected the judge will disclose the judge's interest because it is not likely that this is available in public domain and the parties before the judges may not be aware of this conflict of interests of judges. So it is normally expected that the judge will very frankly tell the parties, this is a possible area of conflict and you have an objection to my hearing the case. These are one kinds of possible perceptions of bias that might affect the outcome of the case. There are no instances where the parties tell the judge that after the disclosure, they still do not have any objection to the judge hearing. In the case, this is called waiver, waiver of an opinion. Who are curious to know what could be the various kinds of button to look. into the Arbitration and Conciliation Act that is statutorily recognized. And uh, many judges post retirement are uh, arbitrators and they are governed by the court, by the Arbitration Con undergone amendments. And there are two schedules to the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. One is the fifth schedule. which is titled Unfavorable Doubts as to the Independence or Impartiality of Arbitrators. So among these are arbitration, arbitrators' relationship with the parties or council, that is an arbitrator should, or have any other past or present business relationship with a party, a relationship of the arbitrator to the dispute, Arbitrator's direct or indirect interest in the dispute. Previous service for one of the parties or other involvement in the case. Relationship between an arbitrator and another arbitrator counsel. Relationship between the arbitrator and party and others involved in the arbitration and other circumstances. In fact, there are rules now as part of this that you cannot be an arbitrator for the same party in several arbitrations. Now, there is... One, of course, exception is in some of these instances, if a disclosure is made, the parties can waive the objection they may have to the continuation of the arbitrator. And some are just not waivable. So they make this distinction between what can be waived and what cannot be waived. So you have a seven schedule which talks of ineligibility of an arbitrator to continue as an arbitrator if those kinds of uh, uh, objections are raised and those instances of bias stand in. So this has become a, a very, very uh, uh, sensitive topic, but a very important topic. And in the US Supreme Court, you have had instances, uh, the most, uh, in the recent past, the most prominent one being uh, the one involving Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, Justice Scalia was a justice of the US Supreme Court for many years, for more than two decades. Uh, so this is the year 2003, when uh, cases were brought uh, by an organization involved in uh, uh, environment protection 
to question the decisions taken by the vice president of the United States at that point in time. Dick Cheney. Scalia was part of the bench. As uh, some of uh, you may be already aware, the US Supreme Court has nine justices and they sit what is called en banc. That is, they sit together. And uh, they, unlike the Indian citizen, as many as 17 benches, the US Supreme Court, all of them sit together. In fact, there are very few Supreme Courts in the world which sit, which sit in benches. Most Supreme Courts in the world would sit on bank, but that's a discussion for a different occasion. So the objection was Vice President Cheney and Justice Scalia went on a duck hunting expedition. And this was not a mere matter of speculation, this was a fact. They in fact went in an aircraft together to the uh, site where the duck hunting took place and uh, they were found together in the duck hunting expedition and they came back. So the petitioners asked, this is Kalia should recuse. Again, for viewers who may not understand legal jargon, recusal means the judge dissociating, judges justice dissociating herself or himself from the hearing of a case. So the judge recuses. Usually reasons will have to be given by the judge for recusal. But uh, as it happens in the matter of practice, there is not an obligation, there's no obligation placed on a judge to give reasons for recusal. In this case, Justice Kalia maintained that he will simply not recuse. Uh, and his reasoning was uh, somewhat, uh, you know, uh, let's say, strange. And this is what he said. Let me respond at the outset to Sierra Club's suggestion that I should resolve any doubts in favor of recusal. That might be sound advice if I was sitting on a court of appeals. There, my place would be taken by another judge and the case would proceed normally. On the Supreme Court, however, and this is the question of benches, the court of appeals in the, Supreme, in the United States sit in circuits and sit in different benches. I'm proceeding with the, the court uh, attributed to Scalia. On the Supreme Court, however, the consequence is different. The court proceeds with eight justices, raising the possibility but that by reason of their vote, it will find itself unable to resolve the significant legal issue presented by the case. Thus, as justices stated in the 1993 restatement of recusal policy, we do not think it would serve the public interest to go beyond the requirements of statute to recuse ourselves out of an excessive caution whenever a relative is a partner in the firm before us or acted as a lawyer at an earlier stage. Even one unnecessary recusal impairs the functioning of the court. And he went on to argue that uh, even if he were voted against the party, it would not make any difference to the outcome. So this apparent uh, uh, possibility of a bias was dismissed by Justice Scalia, despite the code, the relevant code in the US reading as such, and it continues to read as such, any justice magistrate of the United States judgment. This, of course, judgment is coming for severe criticism by scholars in the United States. Uh, we've also had our share of dealing with such uh, issues. Uh, I'm going to refer to the case of uh, the Election Commission of India. I'm sure many of you are aware what was uh, an Election Commission of India being a single member election commission with the Chief Election Commissioner became a multi-member election commissioner, Mr. T.N. Sesh. was the Chief Election Commissioner of India, and there were two other commissioners appointed along with him, of course, the Supreme Court of India. But the case which asking for Chief Minister Jailalitha, the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, to be disqualified because the firm in the 
involving her and another partner had actually entered into a contract with the government of Tamil Clearly a conflict and he said legislation. Assembly. That complaint under the is empowered to deal with that complaint. It asks for a report. Report from the governor and so on. I mean, that was one part of the uh Jalalita went to the uh, high court and uh, she said there's a re reasonable apprehension of bias that an election commission of Mr. Station. At that point, when she filed the petition, it was not a multi-member election commission, uh, would, would not decide the issue fairly. A single judge of the Madras High Court held in agreed with her and uh, held that uh, this can't be decided by Mr. Session. When the matter went in appeal, at the instance of the election commission, which was pleading the doctrine of necessity, again, for viewers who may not be aware of this, one answer to the uh, plea of uh, bias is what is called the doctrine of necessity. Under the constitution, it is the only the election commission which can decide this petition. No other body can. Under the constitution, at the relevant point in time, that person has to decide. You can't. Plead bias because that is how it is. Like, for instance, uh, Supreme Court of decides itself whether it is a public authority under the right to information. I'll come to that in a minute. But there are instances where it's only that body against the subject to challenge on the ground of bias, but you cannot prevent the body or the authority from taking the decision in the first place because of this, what is called the doctrine of necessity. Of course, this is a rare uh, uh, defense because you will have instances where, for instance, a matter is before Judge A, who uh, is alleged, is involved in some way or the other and cannot therefore take a decision partially. You file an application asking the judge to recuse. That matter can be assigned to some other judge in, let's say, in a high court or even in the Supreme Court, or the judge recuses. He says, I do not, he or she says, I do not want to hear this case. The Chief Justice will then reassign the case to some other judge. But in this case, the Election Commission had only one, the Chief Election Commissioner. As it happened, by the time the matter traveled to the division bench in appeal to the Madras High Court, it became a multi-member commission. And uh, again, they agreed that now, of course, the uh, doctrine of necessity will not apply because it's a multi-member commission. The matter was further taken up in appeal to the Supreme Court by the Election Commission of India. And the grounds were this. The grounds were the doctrine of necessity still applies. Because the Election Commission of India and see uh, an election commission with only two of them deciding the matter would not be the election commission of India. The Supreme Court decided it in a very uh, unique way, I must say. One, the they said, we have to respect the rule of order to be disputed, that uh, both Mr. Swami and Mr. Session were closely associated, knew each other rather well. But they said there is a solution to this. It is a multi-member commission. They will sit as three members of the commission. But when the case is called out before them, Mr. Session has to recuse. He will recuse. He will say that because of my association with the complainant, I wish to recuse from this matter. And with this recusal, it will then before, be before the two remaining election commissions. There is a possibility that they have a split view. One decides to allow, one decides to dismiss. In that event, the doctrine of necessity will kick in and the casting vote will be given by Mr. Session. So this is how they resolved this complex issue uh, of uh, bias and the doctrine of necessity and combined the two. And it's a very interesting decision for us to read. So it might have been a good answer uh, in, in uh, Dick Cheney's case 
for uh, uh, Justice Kalia to say, I will refuse. And uh, what is also uh, interesting as far as the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Judge A. It is Judge A who will decide whether the accusation is valid or not. And that adds an additional problem. Whether, you know, it is this, the uh, same judge was to decide this for some accuser. Uh, the failure by the judge to recuse affecting the outlier dictator he was from the forces of law in his own country where i mean there were huge allegations of uh, human rights abuses during his regime and the question was about extraditing pinochet from england back to chile to face trial that decision traveled up to the house of lords and one of the members in the house of lords was lord hoffman as it turns out the plea for extradition of pinochet was uh, uh, pushed in a great way by amnesty international and the spouse of Lord Hoffman happened to be the vice chair of Amnesty International at that point in time. And there was no disclosure by Lord Hoffman of this possible conflict of interest. So although they had decided that uh, Pinochet should be extradited to face trial in Chile, once it was challenged and it was pointed out that there was a conflict of interest, which was not disclosed to the parties, the House of Lords invalidated its earlier decision, recalled it, and uh, the proceedings had to again start in the House of Lords without the participation of Lord Hoffman. Uh, so this is another important instance where the rule of bias was uh, put forth uh, to invalidate the decision of uh, judges. Judges face a very difficult task in uh, uh, deciding, but I think I've mentioned this earlier and I will be repeating myself. Uh, I had an occasion to say this. Uh, in, in the Indian context, Justice Krishna has this advice for judges where he says that uh, judges are expected and should be impartial, but uh, judges can ensure equality bounds. So, in that context, when we allow Life to that reality and therefore cannot strictly remain what he calls neutral. A person before him lacks adequate representation, not denied to that person because of lack of proper representation. This is how we have judges in Indian courts appointing, not just in Indian courts, I'm sure in many other courts too, but definitely in the Indian courts. In criminal trials, you'll find judges appointing amicus curate or uh, 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 counsel in the panel of the legal aid committees. And making sure that good quality assistance is given to the court uh, and that the party before the court should not suffer for want of quality legal assistance. So this explains why impartiality is an important value to be adhered to. And uh, in that process, the judges may have to lean only for the purposes of the procedural uh, equality of uh, arms before the court, that they lean in favor of the weak party, make sure the weak party does not suffer for want of good quality representation. As I said, judging is not an easy task at all. Uh, there have been studies to show how judges as human beings have varying moods during that part, uh, during the entire function through the course of the day. There were studies conducted in Israel of the magistrate's court to show that the chances of a person getting bail was very high in the first and during the close of the day almost none at all and judges do tire mentally while they're uh, functioning as judges and they are of course subject to mood swings and so trained lawyers will always watch out for the mood of the court and uh, make sure that uh, you know if it's a particularly difficult case that they do not you know uh, uh, misread the court and push forward without being aware what is the frame of mind in which the judge sitting at what point of time is? And I'm going to lighten up the proceedings just a bit by uh, reading out 
from this book, Judges by David Panic, where he, of course, David Panic is a QC. I mean, and now we are all KCs. Uh, he was a QC and had a fantastic flair for uh, article. and writing and uh, one so Plato I'm talking with the philosopher Greek philosopher Plato mentions this in his writings where and this is what he says in the Republic how far better it is to arrange one's life so that one has no need of a judge dozing on the bench so this dozing on the bench has been commented from Plato onwards and uh, Panic, David Panic talks of Mr. Judges Dodridge, who had the habit of shutting his eyes while sitting on the bench for the purpose of concentrating his attention to the argument without being distracted by surrounding objects and was then jocularly called sleeping judge. In the 18th century, Lord Chancellor King often dozed over his cases when upon the bench. However, Ralph Talbot were invariably briefed for opposing parties in the court, and they were both men of good principles and strict integrity, and were sensible on which side the right lay. And uh, this is really funny. During an 1899 slander case involving an allegation that an acquaintance of Prince of Wales had cheated at cards, the wife, and this is put in courts, sat close to her husband's right hand and had the duty of checking the occasional inclination to sleep, which had at this time become noticeable. In fact, he also mentions the instance of one one Mr. Justice Cave, who regularly barristers dropped heavy volumes on the floor or bang in court uh, if they have to give all attention to every case that is called out and good lawyers watch out for this moment of uh, the judge's day where all the attention is not on the case necessary. There are several kinds that uh, judges have been watching the uh, Judicial Academy. And we have an interesting discussion on bias. I also had to constantly remind you, uh, myself of were the hidden biases within ourselves. And just to share a few instances, uh, I will not, of course, name the persons. Uh, we were sitting in the Judicial Academy and uh, discussing with other peer judges about what was happening in our respective high courts. And I was mentioning how in the Delhi High Court, the instances of young couples coming to the court seeking protection from their own respective parents was increasing. It's not uncommon. Even today in the habeas corpus uh, bench of this, uh, the high courts, and this is now a common phenomenon for the court and say, either we want to get married or we've just got married and we need to be protected from our respective parents who are disapproving of our relationship. And uh, I was sharing with these judges that in the Delhi High Court, we err on the side of caution. We grant the protection on the very first day. Of course, we issue notices to the state and sometimes to the parents who may be parties to the petition and then decide on the next date whether the uh, allegation is entirely correct or not. Uh, when I shared this, a judge from another High Court told me, well, my approach is very different. He said, if such a case comes before me, and uh, uh, I look at the young couple. I will first ask if this young girl was my own daughter, would I you know, tolerate this kind of behavior? So then it told me that the personal orientation of judges, the cultural orientation of judges, uh, and their exposure to different issues does play a big role in how judge judges decide cases. And litigants may not always be aware of these hidden hidden uh, prejudices, hidden biases that judges may be subject to. And uh, this is something that uh, was an eye-opener for me. Likewise, geographical biases. 
you know that i mean we all have formed impressions if person x who standing in the witness box comes from a certain locality or we say all people from this locality one has to be cautioned about or comes from this place or the state communal biases you know we form all these uh, hidden in our growing up we form impressions about many things and it, many of it is not uh, uh, necessarily uh, well informed and now you have something called the whatsapp universe which makes things even worse so judge instance and uh, move on to the next phase of the uh, lecture there is this judge whose married daughter had come back home after a very bad marriage and after facing torture from uh, in the in the marital home and uh, he was very disturbed by it and he was sitting on the criminal roster and shared with some of us how every case that was called out involving a 498a offense where it was the husband or the in-laws of the girl seeking anticipatory bail or bail he would uh, uh, i mean uh, immediately uh, reflect on what has happened to his own married daughter and say that no i have to be very careful when i accept these kind of uh, averments uh, which are which are in support of grant of bail or anticipatory bail and then i mean to be fair to that person he went to the chief justice and said can you reassign me to a different roster because i am unable to be objective at this point in time in dealing with these cases so this is another instance of a hidden bias which can be only corrected by the judge herself or himself because somebody are, uh, listening i mean uh, watching the proceedings may not be conscious that uh, the judge has this kind of <coughs> a conflict inner conflict of conscience so what we try and do in the judicial academies is to actually uh, uh, expose judges to these kind of possibilities uh, that could be a bias of even uh, you know not noticing certain classes of people i'll share an instance of uh, in the judicial academy when we were talking of uh, eye witnesses appreciation of witnesses appreciation of evidence we had an animated discussion using of course case studies and we had uh, somebody come in to serve water to all the judges and after 10 minutes i halted the discussion and i said let's go around the table to find out who noticed the color of the shirt that the person serving water was uh, what was the color of the shirt that he was wearing and you wouldn't believe it we had you know 10 different responses and some very frank responses to say i didn't notice at all so i we then said listen there is an eye witness standing in the box and day he was wearing a blue shirt with black black checks and precision where you know face with passage of time this is just one instance to say that you know you don't take anything and everything at face value you learn to accept human frailty human fallibility in appreciating this so this of uh, what it is and uh, i mentioned what caste by so when we talk to uh, judges judges sir no no i don't believe in caste i don't believe in discrimination and uh, you know uh, this doesn't happen with me this doesn't happen in my and we leave it at that we inner bias so we devised what is called two hands into it and grab how much which are and you hold your hands behind us and you go to the next person who's done the same thing and ask the guy right you part uh, the reverse happens so we stop the game at the end of 5 minutes so people have ended up with various uh you know amounts of chana so we've got bowls arranged and we say those who have got with the, with them since 40 or more small chanas you can you know uh come here 
30 to 40 here, less than 20 here, none at all there. So we've already then divided up into seven. group for the poverty line. So only again. But you should see the look on the I'm sorry, am I audible now? Yes, you're audible. But you're frozen again. You're back again. I see. Okay. Is it any better now? Can I... Yes, it's better, Murali, but you're... You know, you're so dis your voice disappears from time to time and you freeze. Oh, I see. Okay. I've got one response. One saying I'm... Audible. Should I proceed or should you want me to reconnect? Natiket, please advise. Yeah, I think it might be better to reconnect. If possible. Uh, I need some feedback. Should I proceed or? It's better if you can reconnect, if that's possible. All right. Let me do Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, uh, should I just uh, share the picture of uh, Sir Sankran? Let me just do that. So, Mum, will you share the picture? Uh, sure, just a moment. Is it better now? Yes, yes. All right, all right. So basically, I was saying that uh, the uh, the mood of the audience changes according to which uh, circle they belong to. You will find that the body language of uh, those now labeled elite has changed. The person, the body language of the persons in BPL has uh, changed. 
In fact, you had some of the participants come up and say, you know, this is so unfair. I mean, uh, it's a game, all right, but you know, why should I be sitting in a BPL group? So this is then you make them understand that you know, poverty is not a matter of choice, and uh, people suffer various uh, disadvantages because of birth, and one is able to explain the uh, uh, harshness of lived life through these kind of examples. And uh, these are the things we attempt at in the Judicial Academy, where we expose judges to these kind of uh, lectures, experiments, so that they are conscious of the hidden biases. So broadly, it's one of knowing whom we are before, which kind of judges we are before. Also, there could be another aspect to this justice being seen to be done, which is uh, the uh, uh, administrative side of judging. So, which is how the RTI has uh, uh, been interpreted now, fortunately, by the Supreme Court of India to recognize uh, the office of the Chief Justice of India to be a public authority. This is a judgment which came in 2020 after the privacy judgment in Puttaswamy. Of course, building in all the privacy requirements under the RTI itself uh, in, in relation to disclosure of assets by judges, where they have affirmed the judgment of the uh, full bench of the Delhi High Court, of which I happen to be a member. Uh, so, uh, on judicial appointments, I think small steps are being taken to put on online the decisions of the uh, collegium uh, of the Supreme Court on what weighs with them when you know they uh, uh, recommend a certain a candidate for judgeship. Again, I'm not going to uh, take up too much time on that because I also want to mention another important facet of this justice being seen to be done is what are judges allowed to see. So this is another aspect of it. Uh, you may be aware that when government is asked to disclose by the court the records of a case about what materials were you know, considered by the government before it came to a decision, if it involves state secrets, the government can claim what is called privilege. There are provisions in the Evidence Act which allows the uh, department of the government or a ministry to go before the court to say, we cannot disclose this because it's privileged communication. But the judge concerned will rule on it. The judge concerned will look into the material and see if this claim is justified or not. And it's what is called the uh, uh, immunity from public disclosure, whether it's a justified immunity that is being claimed. Off late, a new species has emerged, which is called sealed cover, where the government or the investigating agency or the department says, I will put the relevant information or so-called secret information from private sources. I will not show it to the person who is before the court questioning the decision, but I will put it in a seat cover and show it only to the court and to none else. So this was ruled upon very recently by the Supreme Court in Madhivam publication, which involved uh, uh, a television channel called Media One in Kerala, where the decision not to renew its license was challenged by it before the Kerala High Court unsuccessfully before a single judge and a division bench. But those decisions were overturned by the Supreme Court of India, which acknowledged that the seal cover procedure actually adds to opacity and secrecy and is not consistent with the requirements of natural justice. And uh, that, uh, you know, there are ways of dealing with even this claim for privilege. They refer to uh, the evolving jurisprudence in other courts. And they have come to the conclusion that even if it is a claim for privilege by the government, uh, they can appoint what are called amicus curiae to help the court understand whether the claim for privilege is justified or not. So the court will actually take a final call on the stand of the government on the uh, privilege being claimed from disclosure of a certain document. So this is again uh, another aspect of what the court will be allowed to see and what the other side, that is the litigant before the court, will be allowed to access. So these are uh, the uh, broad uh, things on uh, you know, justice being seen to be done. I know I'm probably running out of time. I don't know, Arunaka, if I have any more time or should we, uh, should I conclude here? And before I conclude, I just want to uh, share some funny anecdotes on uh, uh, what happens before the court. All of you are aware of the uh, Keshav and the Bharti judgment. And uh, there were 13 judges uh, uh, who sat and heard the case. And judges do have a tendency to ask questions. In fact, there are uh, 
excessively participating judges. Sometimes you'll notice that judges do all the talking and the lawyers don't get to do uh, enough. And the lawyers have to wait for that brief moments where they can present their arguments. You watch it in the US Supreme Court. There are very strict uh, time limitations of 40 minutes for each side and then 10 minutes for a rebuttal. And the minute the lawyer gets up in the US Supreme Court, you don't get to see the live streaming as you do in the UK Supreme Court or Canada or even in India. But the US Supreme Court has audio records. And you can actually uh, hear to the audio recordings of uh, that court, uh, tracing back to cases which are more than you know uh, 80 years old. And uh, for instance, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's arguments as counsel, you can still hear. And of course, later when she became a judge, the point I'm making is judges start firing questions at you in the US Supreme Court the minute you get up and you have to be prepared to answer this immediately, then and there. And it's all part of the 40 minutes that's allocated to you. Well, in Keshwan and the Bharti case, which is such an important case, deciding on the basic structure of the constitution. Mr. Palkiwala was for the petitioners and he was advocating this, uh, uh, pushing for this recognition of what are called uh, basic elements, basic features of the constitution. But uh, judges, of course, were very participative and they were bombarding him with questions. So uh, in a book uh, on the life of Mr. Daftari, uh, there is this anecdote uh, that Palkiwala complained to Daftari that he could barely get a proposition in without being interrupted by one judge or the other. And at that rate, the case would drag on in, in, indeterminately. And Daftri said, let me see what I can do. So Daftri then sought, Daftri was not hearing the case. He sought an appointment with the Chief Justice Sikri. And after pleasantries, he complimented Sikri that the hearings conducted by him had attracted attention from far and wide. In fact, a little girl had come to see the proceedings with her father and had inquired from him as to who that young man was who kept repeatedly interrupting the 13 well-dressed gentlemen. And uh, when he mentioned this to Justice Sikri, he took the hint. And uh, apparently from then onwards, there were less interruptions in Mr. Palkiwala's submissions. So this is one more thing about uh, judges and uh, watching them uh, on the bench and for lawyers to be conscious of this uh, in presenting the cases before judges. I don't know if uh, I've uh, uh, done justice to the topic, but I thought I should share some of these things with all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Justice Woodleader. I think uh, uh, in spite of uh, the bandwidth cheating us, uh, it was such a uh, stimulating uh, lecture. And frankly, personally for me, I always thought of uh, judiciary as uh, taking charge of equality, democracy, uh, uh, social justice, human rights, you know, and litigating on that. And we passed our opinions on each one of these. But when I heard you, I looked at the internal nuances of uh, how difficult it is to be seen as uh, 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 rendering justice. And that the kind of case laws that you have given on how it actually evolved over time, I think is a huge learning for all of us. Uh, you know, and I like the statement that you said that you know, the, how the judiciary had to be very, very responsible, uh, that because it has enormous powers and uh, it had to be held accountable and therefore they have to be seen as being fair. They have to be seen as being uh, uh, above board, that uh, they must declare their conflict of interest. Uh, they must not fall for pecuniary benefits. They must not be seen as having biases. I mean, these are the things which we think are so normal, so natural, that at the moment in this context, each one of the things that you have suggested were actually in the, being done in the opposite, I felt. You know, I'm sorry for saying this. I know I should be more careful in what I say, but then that uh, you begin to doubt if we are be, we are seeing justice as being done, you know, and how do we, uh, in fact, look at the huge principles on which the judiciary has actually uh, operated over time. And of course, there were dilemmas in this, as you have stated, that you can't take a fundamentalist view on any issue. 
you know, the kind of issues that you've raised, you said that there are some gray shades, there are some uh, biases that come. How much do you recuse yourself? How much do you get into it? And what are the institutional arrangements for this? And these are such nuanced statements that you've made. Uh, and many of us have not been conscious about the dilemmas the judges themselves uh, uh, face. We, we think of you as an institution and not as a human being. Uh, that looked like the summary of what you have actually uh, said, you know, giving the kind of examples that you have given about uh, whether impartiality or neutrality, what is more important, or uh, what are the sticky issues in being uh, 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 seen uh, as uh, unbiased. And uh, the ending that you have done that we all carry out by the biases. We knew that, but then at the same time, the way you said it, and I'm glad that you raised it in the Judicial Academy. You know, that uh, we were so aware, you know, and so many of the judgments, even I suppose what you have yourself experienced on the homosexuality issue. There must have been abundance of prejudices on uh, on these kinds of uh, uh, issues, and how would one combat it? The society is not prepared, but we are mature. We, we are aware, and we know what the truth is. And what kind of dilemma? How does the judge go ahead of the system, ahead of the society, and become a guiding factor? And then would it be seen as uh, rendering justice when you're not in sync with what the society actually uh, thinks? I mean, these are many, many issues that you have raised. And uh, I think a lot of lessons that the judges that themselves have to learn. You know, you in a very subtle fashion said, that we are all human beings after all. You know, don't put us on a pedestal. And we are also grappling with uh, our own conscience, our own past, our own biases. Uh, and still, you want us to render justice, you know? But you have somehow overcome all those biases. You know? And some judges like you have gone beyond personal experiences, have transcended prejudices and identities, have become uh, so-called modern, uh, you know, and in uh, and in favor of uh, truth, in favor of moral principles, and I think that is what is keeping the system going. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, lecture, and we have in indeed uh, learned a lot. I wish it is published and yes. circulated. This is the request I make of uh, uh, the organizers here because we need to we need to actually look at you as human beings and as well-meaning human beings. Thank you very much for this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, may I now ask, uh, is there anything, uh, may I ask Lalit Mathurji, who is again a very highly respected uh, uh, you know, civil servant from my own state, former uh, Andhra Pradesh, to please present the vote of thanks. And I must say that I was delighted to be part of this uh, commemorating uh, SR Shankaran. And thank you very much for uh, 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 Safai Karpuchari Andolan, Center for Equity Studies, and also the School of Democracy for giving me this opportunity. Lalit Mathur. Thank you, Shanta. After such a fascinating talk by Justice Muridhar, and after what people have said, I been I wonder if there's much which I have to say. But I will add something from my personal experience. In fact, when I think of Shankaran and a memorial lecture, my first reaction is he would have been embarrassed because he didn't believe in all these things. But then he would have also been enthused by the fact that the values and the, the rights and the dignity of life and people that he believed in, that is being re reinforced and much more so in these times. And so perhaps he would let this pass. I was fortunate to have known Shankaran and worked with him since the mid 70s in Andhra. I saw him in also in Tripura, in Delhi, back in Andhra and back in Delhi again. And it was such a rich and enriching experience that uh, uh, one can't, I, I can never forget it. He was a favorite 
much. And he was a special person admired by so many different kinds of people, each one outstanding, even legendary in his or her own right. His senior colleagues, Krishnan, the first to hold meetings in Harijan Vadas and even being reprimanded for them. Then B.D. Sharma of several avatars, the architect of subplans, tribal subplans, and then an activist fighting on the streets later. B.N. Yuganda of varied, varied, varied contributions, part of the Shank team which negotiated Shankaran's release. And then the counterpart of uh, Yoganda was Chandramali, who many of us in Anda would remember, a uh, brilliant officer who also worked in bonded labor, tribal development, and he would often tell Uganda, you go to libraries to read things, I work in the field. And they got on beautifully together. Then T.L. Shankar, who was uh, very rightist in many ways, uh, but then he also came to believe in rural development and all that Shankaran stood for. He valued that and uh, lived with it and thrived in it later also. You also had Kanabiran, whom we, Shankaran really got to know after he retired and, and so many others. He was a legend in everybody's mind and his the regard that different kinds of people had for him was something which is absolutely unusual. I remember, I think Harsh would remember, when he was in the academy, he needed some money for uh, the auto, mechanized uh, rickshaws. And Shankaran just rang up the chairman of IFCI, I think, and he very gladly gave the money for that. And that, uh, that carried on. Somebody totally unrelated uh, was with him. Then in Andhra, when he was Principal Secretary of Social Welfare and Tribal Welfare, he really did a remarkable thing. Uh, he was able to get, on the one hand, the employment uh, aspect for scheduled caste with the distribution of land, irrigation wells. For housing, he had a massive program with Ram Babu in charge of that. Then he had in... Uh, uh, education, the residential schools, which were started uh, in every district, very perfunctory level in one way, but later on it, it, it developed and today they are absolutely outstanding elements. For tribal development, the land transfer regulation, all that, as Secretary of Tribal Welfare, he was able to bring that along. Then, for after Karim Chedu and the bonded labor, he brought in a great deal of uh, uh, government orders which would facilitate uh, the security and, uh, uh, and uh, of the uh, scheduled caste and bonded labor particularly. This was done beautifully all by him putting it all together. Luckily, we had the umbrella of the special component plant and the tribal sub plant to uh, um, wield it together. But without Shankaran, it just wouldn't have happened. So, and he just wouldn't give up. He would say that there's nothing which we cannot do in government because we are the ones who stand for the people for whom there's nobody else to come in. Then he, after retirement, there were two concerns which really uh, engaged him. One was the SKA. He came across Wilson, a remarkable person he recognized. He was, uh, he, he, he had a passion of his commitment, which Shankaran would see, which was from his personal experience. He saw the potential of his mind, and he in initiated him first into getting on with the Andolan, second in understanding the proceeds and uh, the process and the organization of government, almost like a mentor. And I think that is all as much due to Wilson's commitment as Shankaran recognizing and pushing pushing up, uh, pushing forward with it. And he brought together in the group people uh, uh, like uh, Usha uh, Ramanathan, who was giving the legal inputs, then Bhasha, who brought up, who was a journalist with an extreme sensit 
sensitivity and her book unseen is, is a remarkable one for those who haven't read it then paul divakar who was able to get uh, uh, certain organizational elements in all this he put together to get uh, wilson going i think that was his major commitment after he retired and he really felt uh, absolutely involved as much in that as he was in government work and the second which harsh mentioned was the committee of concerned citizens there he tried to blend together a partnership between a political leadership which could be sensitive and the frustration of idealism in the youth that had driven them to the dead end of violence and this he was able to put together i think in the experience of the kidnap must have also got him particularly sensitized to that but that was an experiment for several uh, i think one and a half years in andhra it was a great 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 help i think it, that is again a tribute to shankaran which uh, uh, is uh, has to, probably should be followed sometime now in the later anyway with i have talked too much i must thank everyone uh, shant shanta sinha for being such a wonderful chair and of course justice murli dhar has been absolutely outstanding it was really fascinating murli to listen to your lecture it was uh, i think as uh, shanta has said i hope it is recorded to harsh mandar for uh, being involved for his comments for radhi subramanyam and to of course aruna and uh wilson thank you ever so much and thank you everyone for being part of this thank, thank you. you thank you so aruna i think you should close yes we should close with a commitment that we'll come back again next year and meet and we shouldn't let this structure of this memorial lecture go we will all meet we all pledge to mr shankaran that we will carry on with our work uh, upholding his commitment and his principles he remains invisible but a great touchstone for, to all of us who are in this uh, in this virtual space and to many more besides it's been wonderful having you all here hope to meet you in virtually yes but also physically in many parts of india thank you very much shanta harsh reddy of course justice muralidhar who had uh, who had some reservations about uh, taking this lecture on but has done a great job a brilliant job and to lalit thanks to all Thank of you. you from wilson and i wilson has uh, left to board a flight to delhi but he is listening to it on his phone i think somewhere so thanks to, from the two of us in harsh thank you very much indeed thank you well, well.